Let's take a moment to look at the beauty of this photo. This photo was taken by the Cassini spacecraft when it was orbiting Saturn. That is 900 million kilometers away from here. And now you see a small blue dot. That dot is the Earth. It is our home planet. It seems completely insignificant from such a distance. But we know it is actually everything but insignificant. It is the only planet in the universe where we know there is life. I do a lot of talks on space, and in every talk I get the question, are we alone in the universe? And I always have to respond that there's a good chance we are not, but we actually do not know. Answering that existential question is actually what you would call a moonshot. A nearly impossible thing to achieve, something so big and difficult that you need a major technological breakthrough to be able to answer that question. The term moonshot is also used by big companies like Google for projects which eventually will change the world. The term moonshot came from a speech which JFK gave in 1962. In that speech, he announced that the US would put a man on the moon. At that time, the US was far behind the USSR, the Soviet Union, in space. So it was a nearly impossible goal to be, to be set. Kennedy didn't want to make the space program 10% better, he wanted to make it 10 times better. He didn't want to make a small step, he wanted to do a giant leap. And that is the definition of a moonshot. Not a small step, a giant leap. And when JFK um, announced his clear goal, it was inspiring a whole nation. Um, it was super simple. We put a man on the moon, we bring him safely back to the Earth, and we do this within a decade. A clear goal and a clear deadline. And every uh, thing sounded impossible, but it inspired more than 100,000 people in the US to cooperate on the project and make this moonshot goal a reality. A moonshot mindset was born. And to explain what a moonshot mindset is, I would like to tell you a story. It's a story about JFK, John F. Kennedy, visiting a NASA facility. And he was welcomed by scientists, astronauts, uh, engineers, which explained with the greatest passion how they would realize his dream to put a man on the moon. And by the end of the visit, there was a guy sitting in the corner. It was a janitor. It was somebody who recorded who came into the building and who came back out. To the outside world, a seemingly less important position or a cooperative work which he was doing on the project. JFK didn't know what the guy was doing, so he went to the desk and said, ah, what do you do in this, uh, in this building? And the guy said, Mr. President, I'm helping you to put a man on the moon. This janitor realized that he is actually a valuable part of the whole system, that he's not just doing a janitor job, he's being part of the 1962 NASA space team. He wasn't merely a janitor, he was actually a very valuable part in the whole chain. A moonshot mindset is also a very positive mindset. You believe that you will be able to achieve the nearly impossible, although everybody else will tell you it is impossible. And to uh, give you a very, a very nice example of that, I'm a big fan of the people which worked in the Apollo control room. Sometimes I also work in these control rooms, and it's just very, very cool. But these guys, they were responsible for so many things, such an important goal for the whole world, while the average age of these people was 28 years old. 28 on average, so they were much younger and some were much, much, much older. One of the controllers worded it brilliantly at some point. He said, we didn't know it, is, it was not possible. It could not be done. So they just went in with a positive mindset and made it happen. I also had a moonshot. I'm very passionate about space, that's why I talk about space. Um, but when I was a teenager, I always wanted to become a space engineer, but the future didn't really look that it, that was possible. I had dyslexia, I was, it was very difficult to read, and my school results were actually quite poor. But I had a dream. I would become a space engineer. And with this mindset of trying to achieve the nearly impossible, 
I actually made it, and I'm now a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering. When I came back to my home country, I was very proud. I had diploma at hand, and I applied in Belgian space companies. I didn't get any job. I did get many other job offers. I was offered a job to work on a dredging boat in Dubai. Uh, I could be a management consultant. Uh, I could do a lot of other stuff. And although these jobs are really interesting, they make good money, and actually it would be the obvious choice, I knew that if I would take one of those jobs, I would be giving up my moonshot goal. If I would accept a first job outside of my passion, I would probably never be able to get back into, uh, into that. So I was stubborn. I worked in a supermarket. I sorted fruit. And the best job of all, if you ever get the chance to do it, is to drive new cars from boats in the harbor. Really nice. I was really stubborn and persistent because I wanted to achieve my moonshot goal. And a couple of months later, I got a letter. I was accepted to work on Europe's largest uh, space telescope. It was a dream come true. Uh, something which was nearly impossible to imagine that I would ever be able to do that. And now I've been working in space for 20 years, and I still feel that moonshot mindset, that passion to work on amazing projects every day. Actually, if I think about it, I never actually worked a day in my life. I just have a hobby which is a bit out of control. After traveling through Europe, I came back to Belgium. And yes, in Belgium, there are space companies, and we do amazing things. I have colleagues who build instruments for the ISS, other colleagues who build docking stations which will fly to the moon. And I even have colleagues who grow bacteria which one day could feed the astronauts going back to the moon and to, and to Mars. So when I was working uh, in my daily job, I usually built Proba satellites. They're quite small satellites. They find a very pragmatic um, uh, sweet spot between being good at very good science while having a quite uh, modest budget. One of the Proba satellites is called Proba 2. And Proba 2 is what you would call a solar observatory. Every minute it will take an image of the sun. Actually, for an engineer, it's a bit boring because it's always the same image. But then, on a certain day, 2012, something was photobombing our solar science images. I'm going to let you guess a little bit. What is this little black dot which is going through the image? It is actually Venus. It is Venus passing through. It's what you would call a Venus crossing. It's a bit like a solar eclipse, where you would have the moon between the sun and the earth, but then with Venus. Because Venus is much further away, it actually only covers a small part of the, of the sun. And after the Proba 2, we were quite popular. Solar scientists knew where we live, so they had all sorts of questions. And the question came up, the best of all, which was, can you build a satellite which will image the corona of the sun? The corona of the sun is a bit like the atmosphere of the sun. It has a cool nickname, it's called the Ring of Fire. There is, however, one big issue. The corona of the sun is very hot, but it's, it's not very bright. So it's about a million times less bright than the sun itself. So if you would have the sun in the picture, you cannot see the corona because all the light of the sun is polluting the light of the corona. So as a space engineer, we were challenged to find a, a, a technical solution for this nearly impossible project. A moonshot was created in our minds. So, we can actually already see the corona of the sun. You actually can do it every year when there's a solar eclipse. When the moon nicely covers the sun, you can actually see the corona in a perfect, uh, perfect manner. So, we knew our solution. We had to create an artificial moon, because the actual moon only covers the sun about once a year. To build an actual fake moon was a bit difficult, but there's an instrument which is called a coronagraph. A coronagraph is a satellite which has a small little, little disk in front of the camera, which casts a shadow on the camera itself. And although built by the greatest minds, the images of the corona are actually very, very poor. The main reason is that this fake moon, this, this occulting disk, is very close to the camera, and on the side, the light is distracted or diffused in many, many different directions causing a very bad image. So we had to find a solution. With an actual, uh, or the difference between images from a coronagraph and, different, and images from an actual solar eclipse with the actual moon, you can actually see that it's not 10% better, it is 10 times better. 
It's the definition of a moonshot. So we found a solution and we tried to find how we can solve this. And how you can solve this is our solar scientist explained to us that actually if you could separate the occulting disk from the camera from 150 meters, we would have the perfect picture. So we tried everything we could. We did all the possible engineering which we, which we could find and we quickly realized that building a 150 meter long satellite is impossible. It's not nearly impossible, it's just impossible. To put it in perspective, the ISS is a 150 billion dollar space structure and it only measures 109 meters. So we have to build something of 150, it is nearly impossible. But in Belgium, we're very good at building small satellites. So instead of building one huge, costly satellite, we decided to build two small satellites. One will, will be round and it will cast a shadow on the other one. The other one will have a more conventional form and it will have the camera to image the corona. They were actually launched together and after about a month, somebody in my team will press a button and the two satellites will separate and they will orient themselves in a formation forming one virtual telescope to image the corona of the sun. The image, the both satellites are actually almost ready. They're in our clean room in Kruijbeek, very close to Antwerp. And we plan to launch them in 2024. A moonshot almost achieved. While we were working on Proa 3, NASA announced some very, very nice plans. They're working on this biggest question of all time. Are we alone in the universe? And we're actually getting much closer to answering that question. We have so many powerful telescopes on the Earth and in space that we're starting to get a grip of how many stars there actually are. And there are a huge amount. If you would walk on a beach this summer, look up and try to count the stars, you might find 10, maybe 20, 25. But then realize that there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches on the Earth. And actually, when we look at these stars, we can find also planets. We call them exoplanets. And so far, 5,500 of these exoplanets have been found. Giant planets like Jupiter, but also rocky planets like the Earth. And about 100 of the ones which we discovered are in the Goldilocks region. The Goldilocks region is a small, narrow region around the star where it's not too hot and not too cold, so that liquid water can exist. Liquid water is what we currently know the source of life on Earth. But these exoplanets, they are very far away. They are light years away, so it's very difficult to actually go there. The only thing we can do is look at the light of these planets. The light will tell us whether there's methane, whether there's oxygen, the ingredients of life. But again, we have a problem. The problem is that the light from the planet is much fainter than the light of the star itself. It's again about a million times less bright. So we need to do something. We need to find a way to block the light of the star and to be able to see the planets. We've, we've talked about this before. This is what actually Proba 3 is, Proba 3 is doing with our own star. So we have not only going to realize the moonshot of us, we're going to realize the moonshot of the whole world. Proba 3 will be a cornerstone in that, uh, in that mission. NASA is therefore proposing a mission with not just one big satellite, but also, like Proba 3, two satellites. One round one, which will cover the light of the star, and then a very big telescope, James Webb type, which will then take, take images directly of the, uh, of the planets. So again, the technology which we're demonstrating with Proba 3, a Belgian mission, is actually a cornerstone in the technology needed to find the answer to the question of questions. Are we alone in the universe? So, look, this is my, or part of my, Proba 3 team. All engineers with great passion. They're working on annoyingly difficult problems where in our case, Google nor ChatGPT can ever give the right answer because of the very specific subsystems we, uh, we work with. But these people are encountering the problems and trying to solve them. These problems are actually quite the same as the problems you would see in embedded software for a car or for even a washing machine. But although the problems are the same, 
These people are working with a different mindset. They have a dream, they have a passion, they want to build something which actually goes to space, and they're working on their moonshot mission. So let's go back to the opening image. You might sometimes think that you're insignificant in the whole universe, in your class, in your school, in your company, in your family, in your country. Be convinced that you are that pale blue dot, a dot with enormous potential, ready to conquer the world. Many engineers which are working in our team are actually coming from here, from KU Leuven. So I want to challenge you. There's a world of opportunity out there. Find your passion and live up to that. Think big, raise the bar, stand on the shoulders of giants. Find your moonshot passion and realize it. Don't tell me the sky is the limit if there are footprints on the moon.